ESO's Paranal Observatory in the Atacama Desert. An ocean of calm and scientific investigation. But not today. Film crews and actors have descended on the site, recording the latest James Bond blockbuster, and the Paranal Observatory has a starring role. This is the ESOcast, cutting-edge science and life behind the scenes of ESO, the European Southern Observatory, exploring the universe's ultimate frontier with our host, Dr. J, a.k.a. Dr. Joe Liska. Hello and welcome to this very first episode of the ESOcast. This brand new vodcast is dedicated to bringing you the hottest signs and the latest news from the European Southern Observatory, home to the world's most advanced telescopes. For this first episode, we actually have some rather unusual news to report on. One of ESO's sites in Chile, the Paranal Observatory, featured prominently as an exotic location in the filming of the movie Quantum of Solace the latest adventure of that most famous of secret agents, James Bond. Paranal Observatory is home to ESO's very large telescope. Boasting an array of four giant eight-meter eyes, it is without a doubt the most advanced telescope in the world. Paranal is located on a mountain 2,600 meters above sea level in the Atacama Desert, thought to be the driest place on Earth. The high altitude and extreme dryness make it perfect for astronomical observations. But the conditions at Paranal come with a price. In this forbidding desert environment, virtually nothing can grow outside. The humidity drops below 10%, there are intense ultraviolet rays from the sun, and the high altitude leaves people short of breath. Living in this extremely isolated place feels like visiting another planet. So it's no wonder the site was chosen to film Quantum of Solace. The movie continues the story of secret agent James Bond, played again by Englishman Daniel Craig. This time, he's determined to take revenge on the organization that caused the death of the woman he loved. And it's this quest that brings him to the desert. I think that the landscapes and what the landscape gives us and what it gives, a, gives to, to Bond and the character is, is really, really good because in a sense, you know, we're shooting in a desert and that's sort of a reflection of Bond's character himself because the desert always brings, in, uh, brings along a certain loneliness and a certain solitude and a sort of so, that solitude and loneliness sort of reflects who Bond is at this point. We're about two hours east of uh, Antofagasta, which is on the Chilean, North Chilean coast in the middle of nowhere, up, up how many feet up, about 10,000 feet up over here? Uh, we were lucky enough to be uh, accepted up there really because it's a research centre so we were, uh, we were very privileged to be filming up um, at the observatory uh, and using it for one of our key locations in the movie. Um, it's a stunning place. To make it possible for people to live and work at Paranal, a hotel or residencia was built in the base camp providing a refuge from the arid environment outside. Here, returning from long shifts at installations on the mountain, the crew can breathe moist air and relax, sheltered from the harsh conditions. The residencia's award-winning design, including an enclosed tropical garden and pool under a futuristic domed roof, gives its interior a feeling of open space within the protective walls. It is a true haven in the desert. This unique building serves as a backdrop in the Bond film. The Residencia is, in fact, the hideout of Maverick Dominic Green, played by Mathieu Amaric. It's his facade. It's his nice side. This is to save the planet. It's an eco-park, great idea. Using natural resources, not to pollute the planet, try to plant trees and kill the desert and great stuff. The Paranal Residencia is elegant, built with robust and inexpensive materials. Taking advantage of an existing depression in the ground, architects created a unique subterranean construction with a single facade opening towards the Pacific Ocean, far below at a distance of about 12 kilometers. It has the same color as the desert and blends perfectly into the surroundings. Natural daylight is brought into the building through a 35 meter wide glass covered dome, a rectangular courtyard roof and skylight hatches. 
The originality of this design made it possible to create an interior with a feeling of open space, despite the underground location. The film crew of about 300 people shot some of the most critical scenes in the movie at Paranal. The ESO director general, Tim Deziu, happened to be on site during the filming. We're all delighted that they're here and it is extremely good to see how careful the crew is with the surroundings and how mindful they are of the fact that they are in a, an operating working observatory. So clearly the crew couldn't do all of the filming at the observatory itself. So they created a mock-up of the Paranal Residencia at the world-famous 007 stage at Pinewood Studios. In reality, of course, the Paranal Residencia is home to all the technicians, engineers and astronomers that make the very large telescope, or VLT, one of the most successful and efficient science machines ever built. Who knows, maybe one day the VLT itself will feature in a James Bond movie. This is Dr. J, signing off for the ESOcast. The sky is no longer the limit. In an unprecedented 16-year-long study using several of ESO's flagship telescopes, astronomers have produced the most detailed view ever of the surroundings of the monster lurking at our galaxy's heart, a supermassive black hole. The research has unraveled the hidden secrets of this tumultuous region by mapping the orbits of almost 30 stars. This is the ESOcast, cutting-edge science and life behind the scenes of ESO, the European Southern Observatory, exploring the far reaches of the universe with our host Dr. J, a.k.a. Dr. Joe Liske. Hello and welcome to the second episode of the ESOcast. Today we have a very cool piece of science for you. A team of German astronomers with characteristic precision and patience have spent 16 years mapping out the motions of 28 stars orbiting the very center of our Milky Way galaxy. Now astronomers have believed for quite a while that the center of our galaxy is the site of a supermassive black hole. Black holes are a consequence of general relativity. They are objects that are so dense and whose gravity is so strong that not even light can escape them. These observations that we're going to show you today are the best evidence yet that black holes are not just theoretical constructs, but actually do exist in reality. This is truly a milestone result. Observers under dark skies, far from the bright city lights, can marvel at the splendor of the Milky Way arching in an imposing band across the sky. Zooming in towards the center of our galaxy, about 25,000 light years away, you can see that it is composed of myriads of stars. 
This is a pretty impressive sight, but much is hidden from view by interstellar dust, and astronomers need to look using a different wavelength, the infrared that can penetrate the dust clouds. With large telescopes, astronomers can then see in detail the swarm of stars circling the supermassive black hole, in the same way that the Earth orbits the Sun. The galactic center harbors the closest supermassive black hole known, and the one that is also the largest in terms of its angular diameter on the sky, making it the best choice for a detailed study of black holes. So what this team did was that at various points of the past 16 years, they kept taking images of the very central region of the Milky Way. Now from these images, they were able to map out the motions of a total of 28 stars. Now what these motions showed was that these stars aren't just moving about randomly, but that they are clearly orbiting a very massive central object. And the point is that this central object is completely unseen. Now from the motions, it's also possible to deduce the mass of the central object came out to be a little over 4 million times the mass of the Sun. Now what's more, that enormous mass has to fit into a tiny little volume, and so one cannot escape the conclusion that the central object really is a black hole. The observing campaign started with observations made in 1992 with a sharp camera attached to ESA's 3.5 meter new technology telescope, NTT, housed at the La Silla Observatory in Chile. More observations have subsequently been made in the last few years using two instruments mounted on ESO's 8.2 meter Very Large Telescope, VLT. Over the 16 years of this study, ESO's telescopes have stared at this one region for 50 full nights. This new research marks the first time that so many of these central stars have had their orbits determined so precisely. The data also reveal a lot about the characteristics of these stars and how they must have formed. For one of the stars, the astronomers were even able to follow it for a complete orbit. The star approached the central black hole to within just one light day. That's just five times the distance between Neptune and the Sun. Professor Reinhard Genzel from the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany is the leader of the team that made the discovery. Reinhard, why is it so important to study the center of the Milky Way? Well, you see, the Milky Way Center is one of the most important laboratories we have to study in very great detail what's happening in centers of galaxies, in much more detail than we can ever hope to do in, in all other galaxies. Yet, here we are, we can study whether there's a central black hole, what happens around it, and so forth. All very general issues which you would like to explore and which you cannot really uh, study that much in detail in other galactic nuclei. Dr. Stefan Gillissen is the first author of the paper reporting the study. So Stefan, tell us, what's the most important result you obtained? The most important result of our research really is that we have now empirical evidence for the existence of a massive black hole in the center of our Milky Way. The mass of this black hole is around 4 million solar masses and we know the mass at the percent level. This is of course an amazing result. But the team doesn't plan to stop here. Now in the past, they've used the novel technique of adaptive optics to remove the blurring effects of the atmosphere. In the future, they plan to do even better and to get even higher resolution images by using another new technique called interferometry. This is where you combine the light from two or more of the VLT's unit telescopes together. So Reinhard, what's the next step? Well, you see, at this point, we really uh, are fairly sure that there is a massive black hole at the center of our Milky Way. And the next thing, we want to actually play with it. Play with it in the sense that we want to use it as a tool to test whether general relativity, the theory of Einstein, is actually wrong or right. Wow, playing with a black hole to test relativity. That's pretty cool stuff. I'm Dr. J, signing off for the ESOcast. Join me again next time for another cosmic adventure. The Atacama Desert in northern Chile. This desert with its high mountains, plateau and active volcanoes is probably the driest place on Earth. This inhospitable terrain is where ESO, together with international partners, is building the world's largest astronomical project. 
The first of 66 state-of-the-art antennas has just been handed over to the project. This is the ESOcast, cutting-edge science and life behind the scenes of ESO, the European Southern Observatory, exploring the far reaches of the universe with our host Dr. J, aka Dr. Joe Liske. Hello and welcome to the ESOcast. In today's episode, we're going to travel to the site of ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array. This amazing new telescope is being built right now in the Chilean Andes at an altitude of 5,000 meters. High enough to be literally breathtaking. ALMA will initially comprise 66 high-precision antennas with the option to expand in the future. There will be an array of 50 12-meter antennas acting together as a single giant telescope and a compact array composed of 7-meter and 12-meter diameter antennas. The first 12-meter diameter antenna, built by Mitsubishi Electric Corporation for the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, one of the ALMA partners, has just been handed over to the observatory. It will shortly be joined by North American and European antennas. Each new antenna must meet very strict requirements. The surface of each dish must be accurate to the thickness of a human hair, and the pointing must be precise enough to pick out a golf ball at a distance of 15 kilometers. This antenna handover is a major milestone. The observatory team can now proceed to integrate the rest of the components, including the sensitive receivers that will collect the faint signals from space. The antennas are tested at the Operation Support Facility at an altitude of 2,900 meters before being moved to the plateau of Chaknan Tor at 5,000 meters. The Operation Support Facility will also be the center of the observatory's scientific activities. The ALMA site was chosen because its extreme dryness and altitude offer excellent conditions for observing the submillimeter radio waves for which ALMA was designed. What's more, the wide plateau at Chachnantor offers plenty of space for the array of antennas. The individual dishes will be spread out and linked together over distances of more than 16 kilometers. The ALMA antennas must withstand the harsh conditions at Chachnantor with strong winds, cold temperatures and a thin atmosphere with half as much oxygen as at sea level. This forbidding environment also poses challenges for the workers building ALMA. Although each of the antennas weighs about 100 tons, they can be moved individually to different positions in order to reconfigure the ALMA telescope. Now this will be carried out by two custom-designed transporters. Each of these giant vehicles is 10 meters wide 20 meters long and has 28 wheels. Now that's what I call a monster truck. With ALMA, astronomers will observe the cool universe, the molecular gas and the tiny dust grains that constitute the building blocks of planetary systems, stars, galaxies and even of life itself. ALMA will provide us with new and much needed insight into the formation of stars and planets and it will reveal distant galaxies in the early universe, which we see as they were over 10 billion years ago. I'm Dr. J, signing off for the ESOcast. Join me again next time for another adventure in the far reaches of the universe. And now I really need some oxygen. Have you ever wondered what it must be like to be an astronomer? Let's take you behind the scenes and see what 24 hours in the life of an ESO staff astronomer is like. The countdown for an exciting night with an observation run at the world's most advanced optical telescope, the ESO VLT, has begun. This is the ESOcast, cutting-edge science and life behind the scenes of ESO, the European Southern Observatory, exploring the universe's ultimate frontier with our host Dr. J, aka Dr. Joe Liske. Hello and welcome to the ESOcast. In today's episode, we're going to follow a day in the life of Dieter Nürnberger. 
Dieter is a staff astronomer at ESO. His job is to support those scientists that have managed to get observing time on ESO's very large telescope at Paranal Observatory in Chile. Now ESO receives about 1,000 applications for observing time every six months, and only about one in five of those are actually selected. Dieter spends most of his working days helping the successful few to make groundbreaking discoveries. Dieter Nuenberger is on his way to meet the visiting scientist Chris Tinney and his PhD student Stephen Parker to team up for the night to come. The three have been observing together for several nights. Today is their final evening and they are keen to get started. Over dinner they discuss plans for the night ahead. Well before sunset, they leave the residencia and drive up the desert road to the building housing the VLT control room. At the control building, they prepare the observations and check the setup of the telescope. Observing time on these great telescopes is precious and delays must be avoided at all costs. Like a pilot checking his plane before departure, Dieter goes through a detailed check of his instrument, while the telescope operator does the same for the giant telescope. Everything is good to go, so the team goes to the telescope platform to inspect the weather. The astronomers have traveled far for a glorious view of the universe, and here a glorious view of the sunset is included for free. As usual at Paranal, the conditions are perfect, and Dieter and the visiting astronomers return with high expectations. So, here we go. This is when all the hard work and preparation pay off. For many astronomers, this is a long-awaited moment when they finally get to use one of the world's most advanced science machines to test their ideas of the universe. Let's join them and see how the first observations of the night are going. Cocooned in the high-tech environment of the control room, the observing program is underway. Although the observation is running smoothly, it still requires the full attention of our team. The telescope and weather conditions are monitored continuously. The image quality is looking pretty good across the whole field. The team is using a very clever technique called methane imaging to detect brown dwarfs objects too small and too cold to fuse hydrogen into their centers, and which therefore can be called failed stars. What will the data reveal? We have nice round images everywhere, which is what we like to see. The first half of the night is a success, and the team has already collected a lot of data. So, this is a good moment to shift down a gear. While Dita and his companions stop over for their midnight lunch, the telescope doesn't sit idle though. Their observations continue, being monitored by the telescope instrument operator. As the observations progress, it is vital that the support astronomer and the visiting astronomers are in constant dialogue. Is this the data quality that we expected to see? Do we continue with this target or do we proceed with the next one? Do we change the instrument setup or do we keep it? With Dieter's expert knowledge of the VLT and its instruments, the visiting astronomers can evaluate and decide their observing strategy in real time. At dawn, the observation run comes to an end. Our team is tired but happy. The acquired data look extremely promising and now need to be analysed back in the home institute of the visiting astronomers. This is, uh, this is certainly the best data that anybody's acquired for this sort of experiment before. OK, here comes the night report. The night report is handed over and the astronomers leave the control room building and head back to the residencia. For the visiting astronomers, this is the end of their observing run. So for them, it's time to say goodbye. Or rather, see you next time. But for Dieter, the day isn't quite over. As usual, after an observing run at the VLT, Dieter seeks some relaxation in the morning before going to bed. The swimming pool of the Residencia was built to humidify the extremely dry desert air, but can certainly be used for a quick swim. It's an amazing place, isn't it? But for Dieter, it's all in a day's work. Tonight, he will sleep well, safe in the knowledge that the VLT has once again delivered first-class data to its users. This is Dr. J signing off for the ESOcast. Join me again next time for another cosmic adventure.
ESA's La Silla Observatory, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary and became the largest astronomical observatory of its time, leading Europe to the front line of astronomical research, is still one of the most scientifically productive in ground-based astronomy. This is the ESOcast, cutting-edge science and life behind the scenes of ESO, the European Southern Observatory exploring the universe's ultimate frontier with our host, Dr. J, a.k.a. Dr. Joe Liske. Hello and welcome to the ESOcast. In this episode, we're going to celebrate an anniversary. And quite an amazing one, too. One of the most successful ground-based astronomical observatories in the world, La Silla, is turning 40. With about 300 refereed publications arising from the observatory per year, La Silla remains at the forefront of astronomy. La Silla has led to an enormous number of scientific discoveries, including several firsts. The Harp spectrograph is the world's foremost extrasolar planet hunter. It detected the system around Gliese 581, which contains what may be the first known rocky planet in a habitable zone outside the solar system. Several telescopes at La Silla played a crucial role in linking gamma ray bursts, the most energetic explosions in the universe since the Big Bang, with the explosions of massive stars. Since 1987, the ESO-La Observatory has also played an important role in the study and follow-up of the nearest supernova, SN1987A. The La Silla Observatory is located at the edge of the Atacama Desert in Chile, one of the driest and most isolated areas in the world. This location is virtually free from sources of polluting light. And like the Paranal Observatory, which houses the very large telescope, it has one of the darkest night skies on the planet. At its heyday, La Silla was home to no fewer than 15 telescopes, among them the first and for a very long time the only telescope working in submillimetric waves, the 15 meters cest in the southern hemisphere, which paved the way for Apex and Alma, and the Schmidt telescope which completed the first photographic mapping of the southern sky. The telescopes at La Silla have also supported countless space missions, for example by obtaining the last images of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 before it crashed into Jupiter. While some of the smaller telescopes have been closed over the years, frontline observations continue with the larger telescopes, aided by new and improved astronomical instruments. La Silla currently hosts two of the most productive 4-metre class telescopes in the world, the 3.5-metre New Technology Telescope, the NTT, and the 3.6-metre ESO Telescope. The NTT really broke new ground for telescope engineering and design, hence the name. It was the first telescope in the world to have active optics installed. This is where you have a set of pistons attached to the back of the main mirror. Now these pistons are computer controlled and they constantly maintain the shape of the main mirror so that it can always produce the sharpest images possible. Now this technology was first developed at ESO and nowadays it is used at the VLT and most of the current large telescopes in the world. In addition to active optics, the NTT's dome was also a revolutionary design. The La Silla site was chosen after years of challenging prospecting, partly on horseback, in the Chilean Andes in the mid-60s by the first ESO Director General, Otto Heckman, and several senior astronomers. In the following years, the site was developed and the first mid-sized telescopes were erected. Today, the La Silla infrastructure is also used by many of the ESO member states for targeted projects, such as the Swiss 1.2-meter Euler telescope, the Rapid Eye Mount, and Tara Gamma Ray Burst Chasers, as well as more common user facilities such as the 2.2-meter Max Planck and the 1.5-meter Danish telescopes. The amazing 67 million pixel wide field imager on the 2.2 meter telescope has taken many impressive images of celestial objects, some of which have now become icons of their own. La Silla was ESO's first observatory in Chile and was the start of a long and fruitful collaboration with that country and its scientific community. This is Dr. J signing off for the ESOcast. Join me again next time for another cosmic adventure. <laughs>